And then you say, okay, well, we're going to invest in some redundancy in the system. We're going to have something that can pick up the task of that particular component if and when it's no longer available. That's expensive. It's an investment. You're not going to use it, that redundant component very much, but it's there to provide you with resilience if the unexpected happens. Increasing diversity. This comes right out of ecology. Diverse systems that have a lot of different information in them are better able to respond to unexpected changes in the external environment because you never know exactly what's going to work in that new environment. And if you've got a lot of different ways of doing things and a lot of different information within your system, then it's likely that one of the components in your system will be able to respond in a creative way. So in an ecology, for instance, you want genetic diversity because one of the species or one of the subspecies will be able to perhaps respond to the new climate regime or change in resource availability that comes along. If everything's the same genetically, then it's quite likely that a shock will happen that will take everything out. It's like having a monocrop, you know, in your field, all the same kind of corn. You have one pathogen that affects even one stalk of that corn and takes everything out. You want diversity in the system because it means that it's more flexible and responsive to change. Decentralization is a, re is a related idea. Hierarchical systems tend not to respond well to uh, complex challenges full of unknown unknowns. Again, you want lots of heads in a society or economy working on a problem. You want problem solving decentralized, which is why markets are so good. Markets are, are the most innovative institutions that human beings have ever created, and it's because they decentralize problem solving. You get lots of different heads working on the same problem. Implementing safe-fail experimentation, this is right out of Buzz Hauling. And the key idea here, and actually, it, it, it's a connection with Marnie Cap because her husband, Mel Cap, is the clerk of the Privy Council, the senior civil servant in, in the federal government for a while. And he used to talk about the importance of creating a culture in the public service of creative failure, right? Boy, we've never find that conversation going on in Ontario or the, any provincial public service or the federal public service. The idea that you should actually let these public servants experiment and then fail. Can you imagine what would happen on 24-7 talk radio if we had a lot of that happen? But the result is, in part because of the activities of folks like the Auditor General, Sheila Fraser, who anytime a mistake is made, anytime something fails, crack down on it, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is a waste of taxpayers' money, is that you have a terrified and terrorized, morale-busted public service that doesn't experiment. That's not the kind of governance system that you want in a world that's changing so fast and full of shocks. Here's the lesson, and you probably already learned in your life, so life already. You learn the most from your failures. The biggest hits you've taken in your life are the things that have taught you the most. It's the experience you get from those. So you don't want to eliminate the possibility of experimentation in the system that's trying to respond to rapid change. Whether it's your economy, your knowledge production system, your universities, your government, or whatever. You've got to create the possibility of experimentation. And this is all by way of maximizing flexibility, of making sure there's enough creativity in the system to allow for rapid change to the unexpected that comes down the pike. So, a few more points before I close up and then we'll get a chance to, to talk a little bit. I mentioned the importance of loosening coupling. I want to get a little bit more specific about that because it raises a re an issue that is probably fundamental to your thinking about planning, okay? Because one of the, one of the things, that the, the idea is, that is derivative from this principle is that you need to create regions of human society and human habitation that have the capacity to take care of themselves, that are a little bit more self-reliant than those that we have right now. Our current model is that we want everything connected with everything. And the more connectivity in the system, the better. This model suggests that you can actually go too far with connectivity. In fact, if we're thinking about resilience, you see that resilience in this axis and connectivity here. The general principle that, that most folks would have supported as recently as, say, the last economic crisis, and even now, lots of people, is that the more connectivity in the system, the better off you are, and the more resilient you are. Remember, resilience is the capacity to withstand shock without catastrophic failure. 
the more connected you are, the better off you are. Whether it's resilience or well-being or prosperity or what you have here, it's basically connectivity is a good thing. And, and the argument that I'm making is that the greater your connectivity, at some point you start to get a decline in well-being and in prosperity and in resilience as we see here. So the relationship is inverted, an inverted U. It's not an upward inclined slope. The, the idea is that up to a certain point, increased connectivity makes you more able to withstand the shock, and beyond a certain point, it actually makes you less able to withstand the shock. So take a food system, for example. If you've got a large food producing region with a bunch of sub-regions in it that are producing food, if one of those sub-regions gets a disease or a pathogen of some kind and it can no longer produce its food, if you have a certain amount of connectivity in the system, say up to here, that region can reach out to other regions and get the food that it needs to support itself. If the system is too connected though, that pathogen, when it hits the system, can spread across all the agricultural regions and knock them all, all simultaneously. You can get a cascading failure. So the argument here is the more connected you get beyond a certain point, you can start losing benefit because you get an increase in the risk of cascading failure and you get a decline in resilience. This is quite a radical way of thinking about our world. For instance, you, some of you may have heard of the Washington Consensus on Globalization. The idea that what we want to produce in our world trade system is a, is a world where nations specialize in what they do best, they maximize what is called co their comparative advantage, and everybody trades vigorously with everybody else around the planet, and all the borders are open. It's almost considered heresy to contradict that economic principle now. But this suggests that we can actually go too far with connectivity. And one of the things that we learned in the last economic crisis is that it was those zones in the world, including, for instance, the Canadian banking system, that had some autonomy and had not completely connected themselves to the rest of the global financial system that were more resilient. So think about what that means when you're laying down your plans for the landscape. Think about, for instance, the planning to allow communities, for instance, in practical terms, generate a larger proportion of their own energy have some independence with water supply, have some independence with food supply. So think about the possibility of an energy shock. Right now in Ontario, we are dependent upon a stream of tractor trailers that's traveling 24 hours a day, pretty well year round, from California and Florida to provide us with our food. Someday, those trucks probably will run. Or at least the flow will dwindle to a trickle. And we're going to have to start growing our own food. That doesn't mean we have to go back to eating carrots and rutabagas and potatoes and parsnips. We can actually, with new technology, right through the winter, probably grow a very wide range of food very successfully here with zero carbon energy. So we can talk about how that might be possible. But the first thing we need to do is something that's completely relevant to you. We need to make sure we're not laying down housing across all our good agricultural land. Right? So that's why I'm a big supporter of the, of the Ontario uh, Greenbelt legislation because we have some of the best agricultural land in, the, in North America in southern Ontario and the last thing we want to do is pave over all of them. That would create a very unresilient, a very brittle food system. So the last few slides are going to address uh, what we can do technologically to respond to the challenges that we're facing. And it's based on this idea that what we're coming into now is a general purpose technology transition. Like some of these great technology transitions we've seen in the past, the rollout of railroads, the rollout of electricity in the 19th century, uh, all the way up to the introduction of the personal computer, perhaps green energy technologies in the future. Actually, I think I should take the question mark off because I think it's almost a certainty. Now, in each one of these GPT, or general purpose technology transitions, you've seen a wave of creative destruction sweep across the economy. Industries that were very prosperous have suddenly disappeared and new ones have come in and replaced them. There's been enormous flow of investment, huge opportunities for entrepreneurship and creativity and a really fundamental change in the structure of the economy and often in people's lifestyles and the way they live on the landscape. And I'm just going to give you a couple of quick slides 